Hello, hello. Good evening. Thank you for coming out. What, this is so amazing. I haven't been in here since they fixed it up. This is, boy, let's have a hand for Lena's. This is, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Let's play some music. too much fun. <clears throat> we were together in a band, um, how many, 10 years ago, I guess now? 10 years now, yeah. Uh, called Jawbone. And um, on our very last gig at the Anchorage Folk Festival in Alaska, we received the Jawbone. <laughs> An actual Jawbone. It took us a year. And then we broke up right after that. It just fit in the overhead on the plane. Yeah, exactly. It just a small barely plane, fit. A big Jawbone. It was a Stegosaurus Jawbone. Anyway. Um, but anyway, so we're going to do uh, the theme song from that band, which no longer exists. And um, why don't you introduce Guess what this? It's well, it's called The Old Jawbone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Enough said. <laughs> Walk your bone and walk away, walk your bone both. 
road night and day I've learned so many fiddle tunes from Bruce from back 10 years ago when we had our Jawbone band and uh, just throughout. And this is one that I learned from back then. And it honors one of our presidents. Do we have any fans of George Washington here? Let's hear it for George Washington, shall we? I miss him. <laughs> We hear he's coming back. <laughs> you can be the campaign manager. <laughs> Here's a piece of music from West Virginia. A lot of this music, that uh, the old time music, was collected by people that were forward thinking enough to realize it had to be preserved and it was collected from a great fiddler named uh, Edden Hammonds. And it's one of many, many gazillions of versions of the tune Bonaparte's Retreat. You can become a Bonaparte's Retreatologist if you just kind of root around and realize how many different ways there are to play this tune. But this is one of them. A bona fide Bonaparte. Okay, never mind. There's a, there's, you've heard that field, there's a field recording where somebody doesn't realize what a microphone is and that it's recording the fiddle. And he's standing right next to it and the guy goes to the second part of the tune and he says, he's playing the bony part. <laughs> it's the bony part. <laughs>
Okay. Hold on to that for a second. Let's play it. Okay, we're going to do a little survey here, folks. We're, we get along pretty well and we have a lot of fun, but there's one point, the only point in the night where there's a little dissension is uh, there's one chord that I play that for some reason Bruce doesn't like, and I want to see how many of you prefer the traditional way or the way that I'm doing it. He considers... Oh, okay. Well, no. It's you, just like a push-pull. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not saying which side you should be on. Yeah. The one who's trying to be creative with the music and not be bound by old-time strictures or more kind of stuck in the mud, old-fashioned. I'm not trying to prejudge this at all. Let's just do the B part. We'll do A and B. Here's the A version. Two, three, four. All right, all right, That's one. Section. All right, yeah. one, two, three, go. A, here's B. I think that's laughter of approval. Yes. Okay. By, a, by applause, if you remember Queen for a Day, some of you of a certain age. I can't believe you're doing this. They... Okay, how many of you prefer A? My peeps. And B. I think it's B. <laughs> okay, um, Bruce is going to finish out tonight. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> it's an awkward moment. The, the awkward thing is that he's never asked me whether I like those other chords. He just assumes that I don't like them. You shoot me a look every time I do it. Just because it's fun to shoot you a look, oh. Tony. Cause... All right. Thank you for that non-scientific poll. Okay. Is this, this Doc? This Doc. Okay. Do we have any Doc Boggs fans here? Yeah. Doc Boggs was a coal miner who uh, recorded in 1928 some really amazing lonesome music. He was a banjo player. And then disappeared for 30 years and was rediscovered by Mike Seeger. And Mike Seeger had always wondered what happened to Doc Boggs. And his wife said to him, or he said, gee, I wonder where Doc Boggs ended up. And this was like in 1963. And his wife said, well, did you, where, where was he last heard to be? And do you know the town? Somewhere in Virginia. I can't remember the exact town. Know. Some town in Virginia, small place. And uh, he said, well, from such and such a town in, West Virgi in, in Virginia. And uh, his wife said, well, did you call information? Uh, no. So Mike calls information. I'm looking for a Doc Boggs, D-O-C-K-B-O-G-G-S. Oh, yeah, we have it right here. And he calls the number, and there's Doc Boggs. <laughs> and so uh, Doc Boggs came back on the scene for another four or five years um, and ended up at the Newport Folk Festival in 1963, where I actually got to see him at the tender age of one. <laughs> a little more than that. But I did get to see Doc Boggs, which was an amazing experience. And uh, he ended up recording 50 more sides for Folkways Records, and you can still find those when the government's not shut down. It's Smithsonian folkways these days. So you've got like five days? <laughs> yeah, get it quick. It's called Sugar Baby. Sugar honey baby now Who rocked that cradle Who sang that song Who 
rock the cradle when I'm gone? Who rock the cradle when I'm gone? Scottish music, you know the uh, A Andy. Um, you know the tune, the Mason's Apron. Yeah, we're not going to play that. <laughs> but we're going to play what what happened. One of the things that happened to it when it came it across came across the water and was absorbed kind of into the American repertoire vernacular. Uh, and uh, Tony and I, uh, we have we have. We're kind of at the beginning of a project here, and the project is, and, and hopefully this will last a long time because I love playing with him. But we have we have heroes, you know. We we both kind of subscribe to the notion that that uh, everything comes from somewhere, as does our music and music of the people we really respect, and and so we're trying to to play some of the music from those people, and, and of course play them in our own way. But the Mason's Apron, which is a pretty standard Scottish tune, made it across across the water and, and, uh, and through the hands of families that moved across the Ohio Valley and settled in places like West Virginia and, and, uh, and Kentucky. And one such fiddler came from a family, his name was Ed Haley. Any Ed Haley fans in the audience? I, I know it's a deep dive, but you know, <laughs> it's thank, it, we're, I'm really thankful that, that being a nerd is back in style again, because that's, <laughs> that's the only way you get next to this stuff. But. Ed Haley recorded about 75 sides of music for, uh, for a neighbor who had a newfangled recording machine that he wanted to try out. But Haley never wanted to go far from home. He, uh, he lost his sight at a very early age and, and played on the streets of Ashland, Kentucky for many, many years. Became, uh, when he passed away, John Hartford became very interested in his life and times. And that's kind of how I got into that music, was hanging around John and arguing about how Ed Haley might have moved the bow, you know. <laughs> but this is Haley's interpretation of the Mason's Apron, um, and he called it Wake Up Susan. And we'll follow it with a, another tune that supposedly came from Germany, but I have no way of confirming it. It's called Durang's Hornpipe, so that was probably a lot more information than you wanted. Um, anyway, Wake Up Susan and Durang's Hornpipe.
So we're going to break down into smaller discussion groups right now. Can't get much smaller. This is our, our third um, night of a four-night world tour that started in New York City, and then we were in Pennsylvania last night, and we're here. To, I think we're here tonight. I, the last time last I checked, I saw, yeah. yeah. And then we're continuing in New York State tomorrow. It's our world tour. And every time we get to this part of the show, I have to retune the banjo a little bit. And the first night, it took about two minutes. Last night, it took about eight minutes. So this could be about a 15-minute ordeal for you folks. Perfect? Yeah. How long before I have to tell a joke? Go ahead. He always hurries up when I, when I threaten to tell a joke. Tell the joke, yeah. I'll get off mic. All right. <laughs> They might appreciate Okay, okay, so there's a farmer gets a knock on his door late one night, and there's a distressed motorist standing there, and he says, uh, he says, I'm, I'm sorry to, dis to disturb you so late at night, sir, but I've, I've hit somebody's 
cat with my car, and uh, and I'm wondering maybe if it's yours. I feel so terrible. And the farmer said, "Well, that's awful." He says, "What did what did the cat look like?" And the motorist thinks for a minute. He says, "Well, it looked kind of like this." <laughs> and, the, and the farmer says, "No, no, no. Before that." He said, "Oh." Okay, would you like to hear another one? Listen, I'm no Mrs. Mizell, okay? <laughs> How many of you watch Mrs. Mizell? Me. It's the best show on television. You get, it's on uh, Amazon Prime. It's an amazing, amazing... You'll be binging for days. So I'm going to do a medley of uh, three tunes. The first is John Henry the Steel Driving Man. And um, then going to Bonaparte's retreat, the last part of which I learned from John Hartford, I had a chance to do a banjo fiddle duets with him one night for about an hour and a half, which is one of the, my favorite memories ever in music. And he taught me the uh, last section, which comes from the playing of the aforementioned Ed Haley. And uh, the last tune is a tune that I wrote and recorded on an album called Territory for Smithsonian Folkways. And um, I just never had a name for it, so I made something up just so he could put it on the album and call it something. So I'm still, I still don't know what to call it. So for tonight, it's called the uh, Cafe Lena Breakdown. Thank you very much. Pander. Yeah, I'm shameless pandering.
Well, I was going to play that one. <laughs> I'll play something else. <laughs> hey, jump in on the chorus if you'd like. If, if you, if you, even if you have never heard this tune, you always enjoyed it. You'll find your way in. Does that make any sense? No. <laughs> Lazy John. Saturday comes, going to a dance to have some fun. Why don't you get away, Lazy John? Lazy John, Lazy John, why don't you get your day's work all done? You're in the shade and I'm in the sun. Why don't you get away, Lazy John? Saturday night, ain't coming home till the broad daylight. Then I'll take my baby back home. Why don't you get away, Lazy John? Lazy John, Lazy John, why don't you get your day's work all done? You're in the shade and I'm in the sun. Why don't you get away, Lazy John? At the end of the road Her teeth are crooked and her legs are bowed But we sure have a lot of fun Why don't you get away, Lazy John? Lazy John, Lazy John Why don't you get your day's work all done? You're in the shade and I'm in the sun Why don't you get away, Lazy John? Why don't you get your day's work all done? You're in the shade and I'm in the sun. Why don't you get away, Lazy John? The second tune was called The Rebel's Raid, and it dates back to the American Civil War. I consider myself very lucky to be able to play with this gentleman over here. Amazing. Same as that, buddy. 
So we're going to do a tune. Um, um, back in the 80s, or early 90s, um, I gave a bunch of uh, lessons. I, I have this online banjo school, and he's got a, a school also for competing companies, but we're still friends. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, I used to do a lot more one-on-one -on -one lessons. And every week I would write down what we had done that week and what we wanted to do the next week, what I thought would be good for the next week. So this one student, he was coming in about an hour and 15 minutes for this, his next lesson, and I looked in the book and realized that he wanted to learn a tune called Coal Creek March, which I didn't know how to play. So I had an hour and 15 minutes to figure out this tune before he showed up. And um, I had a record on Electro Records called Folk Banjo Styles, and I knew it was on there. And uh, so I slowed it down to half speed, and um, could tell that the, the first measure was... But he was either, the banjo player was either going across the strings this way or down this way, and so I was stuck on the first measure. I, I already didn't know what was going on. I mean, the notes are correct, but I wanted to play it the right way. And I knew Pete Seeger had played it, so I called up Pete and I said, Pete, um, how do you play Cold Creek March? I said, well, you go down the strings. Thanks, Pete, that's all I had to know. And, and I was ready to go. And he said, no, well, uh, I have this all, Pete said, you know, Tony, I had this all written out in tablature and I'll fax it to you. Faxing. Pete Seeger with a fax machine just seemed like, really? Something wrong about that. But I didn't have a fax machine. So I said, well, Pete, I'll call you right back. And I called my friend who had a fax machine, and, he, and I gave the number to Pete. My friend said he'd call me as soon as the fax came in. And Pete said, yeah, I'll send it right out right now. So there's like 45 minutes left to go before my lesson shows up. Half an hour, 15 minutes, I finally get a call from my friend. OK, the fax came in. I race over to the other side of town. And I uh, got the fax, and I looked at it, and it's all this banjo tablature for the Cold Creek March. Pete had sent it, and then there's a little note that said, Dear Tony, I couldn't find the tablature, so I wrote it out all over again by hand. Pete. Anyway, so, and Pete told me that this is a, uh, perhaps the only instrumental protest song because it details uh, an instrumental form, a strike in the, uh, at the Cold Creek uh, Mine in Eastern Tennessee. And uh, the original version of it had those kind of sounds of harmonics to indicate the, the bugles of the soldiers that were breaking up the strike uh, from 1892. Anyway, so we're going to uh, add a little bit of fiddle to this, and this is Pete's version of the Cold Creek March. I should add that Pete is one of my heroes, both of ours, actually, for that matter. We don't know everything there is to know. <laughs> so we some pretend some to. of it's here. <laughs> Anybody read, uh, read a book called The Mayor of McDougal Street? Yeah. Great book about another of our heroes. Dave Van Rock was his name. And he grew up, I think he grew up in Queens, but he grew up around that whole New York City folk music movement from the very beginning. 
Tony and I discovered we both love a song of his. It's called Green Green Rocky Road. That old folky stuff we love so much. Yeah, and feel free to sing along if you know it. Even if you don't. To, to make a dedication and that song should have been the one but we lost a good friend to the community recently somebody that we all know very well Bill, uh, is Bill Spence and uh, passed away a few days ago and he uh, I played the old songs festival many many times and uh, he and Andy have 
done so much to, to keep folk music alive in the community, he's going to really, really be missed. So we'd be thinking about him tonight. All right, so we're going to do, that was the penultimate tune. This is the ultimate tune. <laughs> Meaning the last tune of our set. And uh, we're, uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention that we do have some merchandise for sale. Perfect for Valentine's Day. <laughs> Fiddle music, banjo music, you just can't beat it. And shall I continue uh, with the most exciting part of the, uh, well, for me anyway? Well, uh, if it has to do with footwear. Well, you know how people aren't buying as many CDs as they used to. I'm not saying you folks, obviously. Obviously not you folks. They're but, out to disprove it, Tony. Yeah, I, I hope you'll disprove that theory. But I started thinking, you know, what are all the big pop bands, the hip-hop bands? They get into lines of clothing. And so I figured, you know, socks. It's all about, thank you, it's all about the socks. I'm wearing some, um, I'm wearing Stegosaurus taco socks right now, as a matter of fact, but that's not what we have for sale, folks. Although I will sell you the socks off my feet if you're, and there's a washing machine and dryer back here just to show you how cool this place is these days. I'm not kidding, in the dressing room, so I'll, in between sets, I'll wash these socks. No, we have banjo socks, folks, banjo socks uh, for sale. You too could walk away, and supplies are limited. And then next after that is cologne. I'm thinking manure cologne for the banjo thing, maybe. Did you say manure cologne? Yeah, why? I just didn't it's a hear concept. you. It's a concept. Yeah. Well, I was going to say something that I thought was interesting, but I'm not sure it's interesting anymore. <laughs> Go ahead. Tony and I, we, we both do teach on, I don't want to say competing websites, but I would say we'd, it's kind of like we went to different schools together. Um, that's a Groucho Marx line. <laughs> but I do, uh, I, if we're, since we're in the region, I'll tell you that, that uh, we, do, we boot up, both do teach, and I, I teach a lot. And uh, put on a, if you want to get your hands musically dirty with a musical instrument, uh, I run a weekend with my friend Deborah Clifford at the Ashokan campus, which is not all that far from here. It's a really beautiful place. The event is called the Old Time Rollick. And uh, it's a weekend, it's about a week's worth of stuff jammed into a weekend. Uh, lessons in fiddle, guitar, banjo. We have wonderful singing led by a woman named Val Mendel. And uh, if you're curious about it, if you want to come to uh, experience a really nice community, this is our fourth time in. You'd be welcome. It's a, it's a great crowd. Come see me. There's some little things you can pick up on the table next to Tony's socks. <laughs> you'll come for the socks, you'll stay for the... Uh, for the Rollick. Uh, yeah. Yeah. For the Rollick with the socks. And from what I understand, we're doing a workshop tomorrow morning, or tomorrow we morning. We are, we are. Um, we're doing a concert and, a, and a, a matinee concert and workshops at a really beautiful uh, organic farm in Hillsdale, which is, uh, I guess, uh, maybe an hour. It is, it is an hour and a half from here, because we're driving there tonight. Um, <laughs> It's called the Medibee Farm, and they, they raise sheep there, they make maple syrup there. They, uh, it's just a really gorgeous place in a, in a big converted barn with a gorgeous floor. So if you're interested, in, you can take a work, short workshop with one of us there. And uh, if you want to hear uh, some of this music again, we're going <laughs> to do that there too. But anyway, tell your friends. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, we may have the manure cologne together by then. So. <laughs> In the meantime, it is a farm. That's true. Yeah. Are you all enjoying yourselves so far? Because we're just running on the house. Thank you. Well, here's a tune that Bruce put on the map. Uh, it's a tune that Ed Haley recorded, and uh, he'll give us your uh, your source. But uh, he teaches at the Berkeley College of Music, and I do also. But uh, I keep running into these fiddlers that learned this next tune from him, and it's been spread wide and far. And if you know, how many of you know Blackberry Blossom? Some of you know. It's, it's a pretty popular tune in the bluegrass and old time repertoire, uh, as we say in Paris. But um, this is, uh, speaking of presidents, this is Garfield's Blackberry Blossom. Is it really true that George W. Bush said that the French don't have a word for entrepreneur? <laughs> I'm not sure. 
I think it's an urban legend. Here's Garfield's Blackberry Blossom. Thanks for listening. We'll be back with another set of music, and we promise not to play anything in the second set that we played in the first set, unless we, for, unless we forget. <laughs> Thanks a lot, folks. We'll be right back. Did anybody leave? <laughs> Yay, they stayed. Yay. We did too. Let's have another hand for Reese, who just was up here. He's It's hard to find a parking place around here, and uh, I called Bruce. I, I was about five minutes behind him, and uh, he said, "Yeah, there's a space waiting for you." He got these orange cones, and I pulled up, and there's Reese, 
takes the cones away, takes up, brings my banjos upstairs. I mean, what more can you do for a guy? For God's sake. He didn't do that for me. Yeah, he did, actually. <laughs> he actually was incredible. Everybody here is wonderful. And yeah. I hadn't been here myself since, uh, since this place looked a lot different. And, and it was cool then. It's way cooler, and, and the sound system is beautiful in here. And, and let's thank Joe for the sound back yes. there. Thank you, Good. Joe, yeah. while we're talking about it. So let's exercise this beautiful sound system and yeah, give it a pump some out. music through it. You got a coin? Uh, no, I'm a little... No. Then let's play this. Salyer, not uncoincidentally from Salyersville, Kentucky, <laughs> recorded on more home recording equipment by a neighbor. It was called Jeff Sturgeon, a fish tune, I guess. I don't know. That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> so, speaking of heroes, Ed Haley. Hale Ed Haley. Here's the Cherokee Polka.
Stacy. All right, we're going to do a tune that I wrote now with my own fingers and brain. Um, maybe 10 years ago, um, I was at uh, a banjo weekend, and uh, they happened to show a film of a gentleman named DeFord Bailey, who was a harmonica player. He was the first African-American to be on the Grand Ole Opry back in the late 20s. And uh, they showed a film of him from 1952, something like that, uh, playing on the Opry, playing just solo harmonica, and he just killed it. Uh, it was a tune called Fox Chase, which is a tune that you find a lot in uh, old blues recordings and old-time recordings as well on fiddle and harmonic and various things. So I was just so inspired by DeFord Bailey's uh, rendition of it that I wanted to write my own Fox Chase and uh, came up with a tune we're about to play. And uh, I played it for uh, Mike Seeger at one point and he said that he could hear two dogs barking in it. So I thought I've, I've achieved what, what I wanted to achieve with it. If Mike Seeger could hear two dogs baying in it, chasing after the fox, I thought that was pretty good. Um, and so I wrote some lyrics for it also, and being a banjo player, banjo players, their minds work like this. Inside my brain, that's what you would find. And uh, so when I write lyrics, it's just voluminous, you know, Shakespeare in overdrive. Not, not the quality, of course, but just, uh, you know, very verbose. And so a friend of mine, Michael Daves, was the one that recorded it on this album uh, called Territory. But uh, it has fallen to our dear friend, Mr. Molsky, over here to have to sing it for you now. And uh, if he can actually get all the words out. Let's play it a little faster tonight, should we? Ready when you are. Oh, okay, let's go. It's a waltz, right? It's a waltz, yes. We, we, he, we both just drank an RC Cola backstage. Seriously, we just had an RC Cola so we could prep up for this tune.
happy here, buddy. Thank you. <laughs> breathe, breathe deep, breathe deep. <laughs> So uh, it's a, uh, I think this is a tune you wrote. I, think we've come I, to that I don't the write show. many tunes. I have to, uh, Tony mentioned earlier this evening that we used to play in a band together called Jawbone with a wonderful guitar player who's actually from, not very far from here, named Paula Bradley. And at one of our very first rehearsals together, we did what new bands do. We kind of threw all of this stuff that we wanted to play out into the middle of the table and, and uh, Try things out, and you know, the discarded some, kept others. And, and Tony, at one point, turned to me and he said, "Well, let's play something you wrote." And I said, "Well, I haven't written anything." <laughs> and because I always kind of figured there's plenty of tunes out there, and I just kind of never got around to it. And Tony said uh, he looked at me with that stern, eagle-eyed glaze, <laughs> and said, "You have one week to write a tune. I'm calling you every day." And he did, he called me a few times and I scared the crap out of me and so I wrote a tune and then I had to name the tune. And uh, it turns out naming tunes are, are almost harder than writing the tune. It's kind of like coming up with the subject line for an email after you've, <laughs> after you've written somebody a, a long piece of hate mail, you know. Um, but but uh, I'm, I admit, you know, I, I'm, I admit that I'm a fan of the TV show South Park. And there's a little, a little kid in a red jacket with a hood that always gets killed. <laughs> he always comes back, so it's like, okay. But, um, but his name is Kenny. And, and Cartman, the creepy kid in the, in the show, always says, the bastards, they killed Kenny. So I had my title. <laughs> Fortunately or unfortunately, um, I play in a duet with a man who's a little more uh, polite than I am. <laughs> and decided that maybe the bastards that killed Kenny might not fly so well in certain circles. So, uh, especially the children's school shows and stuff. <laughs> so, he decided we should make an Irish tune out of it, and decided, and so he, we started calling it Kill Kenny. <laughs> um, but it's really called The Bastards They Killed Kenny. <laughs> Two, three, go.
Kilkenny. Well, we mentioned Pete Seeger as being one of our heroes, and we're going to continue in the Pete mode um, with a guitar tune that he wrote based on a calypso kind of a feel. And I first heard it, uh, he played 12 string guitar uh, on this particular tune, and there's an album Live at the Bitter End on Columbia Records that's probably out of print, and that's where I first heard him play it. And uh, lo and behold, it's one of Bruce's favorite tunes, so we're going to uh, have at it. I have to tell you that, that uh, I live uh, down south of here in Beacon, New York, and uh, which is where Pete Seeger moved to in 1949, and he raised his family up at the top of Melzinga Dam Road, and a very, very rough, uncared for road. The, the Melzinga the Dam and Melzinga Dam is, is the operative word when you try to drive up that road. <laughs> And uh, Pete was, you know, uh, to so many of us, and to me when I was a kid was really an inspiration. I listened to his LPs and sang all the kids' songs. And, and, but he became my neighbor and, uh, and got to know him just as a member of our community, uh, especially in the last few years of his life. And uh, he, his wife, Toshi, was a really incredibly powerful person. I'll tell you a couple of quick stories. I hope it's okay, because his, his memory is really, really important. Um, I went to their house one time, and Toshi said, Bruce, she said, do you have any Pete CDs? I said, well, uh, I have a couple of his old LPs. Well, she disappears and comes back with a stack of CDs. I said, well, that's so nice of you, Toshi. Thank you very much. And she said, hell, she says, I just want to get this stuff out of the house. <laughs> but I, it was October, and I saw Pete in the post office one day. And uh, he said, Bruce, he says, do you know a lot of young people with... Uh, young couples with small children in Beacon. I said, well, yeah, I know a few. You know, it's a, it's a small enough community where you know people. He said, well, I want to have a sing for Christmas time. And uh, I've talked to the, to the police department and the road department, and they've given us two parking spots at the end of Main Street where it makes a, a left-hand turn. And, it, and, the, and the program's going to be an hour because their attention span of the children won't be any longer than that. And... Uh, and would you come sing a couple of songs? I said, well, yeah, I'd love to. So fast forward two months, and I thought, well, this is, you know, uh, just a nice thing he thought of one day because Pete was sort of a visionary. The phone rings. Hey, Bruce, it's Pete. You coming? So okay. And so you got to imagine a very cold day, sun going down. I walk around the corner of Main Street, and there are police barriers blocking off these couple of parking spaces and Pete and a friend of his under the hood of Pete's truck hooking up a, a electrical inverter to the battery on his to, to run a sound system as we do and and uh, and at six o'clock God knows how, how these people found out all these young people and their little kids came and Pete produced these lyric cards that were probably made in 1952, right around the time the Harry Smith anthology came out. And he led everybody in a couple of songs, and, and I played, and a few other people played. And, but, but the thing that sticks in my mind so closely is that um, once the thing got going and the music was happening, Pete was literally dancing around the circle. It made him so happy. And that was really the kind of guy he was. In, in my old neighborhood, we would have said he's a mensch. <laughs> Pete was, was the... the you know, that the kind of thing that he contributed to society, the thing that made him famous, the thing that got him in trouble, um, was his love for humanity. And that's the thing that I try to remember. And this song reminds me of that because, because he wrote it. <laughs> Too much information? Living in the country. Living in the country with new guitar strings. So these two parrots are sitting on a perch and one says to the So these two parrots are sitting on a perch and one says to the other, Do you smell fish? Thought that joke was longer. 
what's gray? A melted penguin. Would you like to hear more? <laughs> I don't know why I got problems. So. Okay, it's, it's solo time again. Again, the smaller discussion groups. And since I went first the last time, I think it's only fair and proper that Bruce should start, because I don't have anything to play anyway. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I won't. Well, I might know something. I play a ballad that was a banjo tune. And then, they, then we took the banjo out of it. <laughs> a, a lot of these old banjo, uh, old Clawhammer banjo players would play a song in 4-4 four, four regular, just kind of regular time. But they would sing a waltz over the top of it. And if you do the math, you can't sing a waltz. You can't sing three over four without having to add a little bit of space. And what happens in really good songs is that those spaces become the important parts of the story. That's where you get to breathe and think about what's happening. And Doc Watson's father-in-law, uh, Gaither Carlton, I think that was his father-in-law, played this on the banjo and sang it. And uh, it occurred to me to take the banjo part away. And what I was left with was this beautiful kind of rubato thing. And uh, it's, a, it's an English folk ballad. It's called Pretty Cero. So I hope you like it. Yeah, 
It's not this long journey I'm a dreading to go Or the country I come from Or the debts that I owe There's just one thing that grieves me And troubles my mind It's a living, my little darling Way back here behind If I were a merchant Then I could write a fine hand I would write my love a letter That she'd understand I would ride by the river Where the waters overflow And I dream of my little Sarah Wherever I go So no, I actually do some do know some other tunes. Um, so I have, you have a choice. You can either listen to one of my original tunes, which is sort of modern sounding, or you can listen to my shameless pandering medley. And I won't be offended if you don't want to hear my original tune. How many would like to hear the original tune? Thank you for that vote of confidence. How many of you would like to hear the shameless pandering medley? Wow, you guys are very urbane. <laughs> All right. I think they're just being honest with you, Tony. Shall I tell you what you're missing out on? Okay, as a banjo player, what would the tunes be in the Shameless Pandering medley? Uh, no, the tunes. Foggy Mountain Breakdown, that's one. No, uh, Shameless Pandering, Shameless Pandering. Delivers. You're not... Okay. He never asked this question to the audience before. I was just being an audience member. I okay, mean, I yes, answered. deliverance. Dueling banjos, okay. <laughs> Rocky Top, yes, and Ballad of Jack Lambert. Thank you very much. But you're not going to hear any of those, because I'm going to do my original tune instead. Unless you want to vote again. It could be like Brexit. No, let's, change, let's try it again. <laughs> This is, uh, is on an album called Great Big World. I recorded this with a uh, chamber quintet, I guess you could say. And uh, this is the solo version, needless to say. I walked into a bar. I'll tell that story later.
gentleman named Bobby Thompson, who's one of my all-time banjo heroes, along with Earl Scruggs, of course. And um, Bobby Thompson played the Jim and Jesse and the Virginia Boys in the 50s and into the 60s somewhat. And um, played with a group called Area Code 615 or Area Code 615, which is the Nashville Area Code. It was all the hot backup musicians in Nashville in the uh, early 70s. And they would back up Tammy Wynette and George Jones, but then they'd also do these hip songs on uh, two albums. And Bobby Thompson was part of that band. And some of you who are more sophisticated than others, shall we say, may have seen him uh, and heard him on a show uh, called Hee Haw. Do we have any Hee Haw fans? Yeah, 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 all right. A great gift to American culture. And <laughs> exactly. Uh, but anyway, if you heard the theme music to that, that was Bobby Thompson's banjo playing all through that, all this amazing banjo playing. And uh, he would appear on the show sometimes with Roy Clark and Grandpa Jones with kind of a funny hat and these kind of deep sunk eyes and a big beard. Uh, just an amazing banjo player. But anyway, I'm going to do a tune, uh, his arrangement of a tune by Red Garland, who was this uh, guitar player in Nashville, and it's called... Um, Sugarfoot Rag, and it turns out it belongs in the uh, old-time repertoire as well. well, as well. A, lot, a lot of these uh, old-timers that some of us got to know uh, listened to all these guys that you're talking about, and they just kind of adapted the tunes into dance tunes in their own kind of communities. And I mean, what you're, the banjo part you're about to play is quite virtuosic. What I'm going to play next to it is pretty much just a square dance tune that you'd play over and over and over for a long time, but it kind of fits in a way. Yeah, you know, and it's got the It's groove. the same thing, but different, yeah. <laughs> I 
changed all the strings on all my instruments today. It was not really a smart idea, but it had to be done. <laughs> and they all paying me back right now. All right. Sugarfoot Rad. Thank you. Well, G. Yeah. Got a couple more for you. And uh, this next one is from the same region as the stage right part of the last tune you heard. <laughs> came from a, one of my heroes, one of the first old people I got to meet. It's really interesting how we consider a generation to be 20 years for what defining characteristic that gives us because the man who first inspired me to play the fiddle, his name was Tommy Gerald, Thomas Jefferson Gerald. His father's name was Benjamin Franklin Gerald. That's not a joke. But you know, Tommy was born in, in 1899 and uh, he learned a lot of his music from various people in his community, some from his dad, but um, one from, uh, some, of, some of it from a man named Houston Galleon, who uh, was a Civil War veteran, who was presumably born in the 1820s. So there you go from my generation to Tommy's generation to Houston Galleon's generation, and you're almost in the 1700s. It's amazing how far back this music can go in that way. But Tommy was an inspiration to a lot of us, and uh, a lot of people used to go visit him. And at one point, he, he put a sign up above his kitchen door because there were people camping out in his backyard. And I mean, he was a real icon to all of us outsiders who were invading him. And, and uh, it said, that the sign said, uh, first three nights free, thereafter $15 per night. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure he ever collected. But uh, we'll play you one of Tommy's tunes. And uh, it's called Stay All Night. And you can if you want, or, or they may close this place. But. <laughs> Thank you. 
all night, don't go home. Stay all night, don't go home. Stay all night, don't go home. Stay with me till morning. Rivers up and I can't get across. Rivers up and I can't get across. Stay with me till morning. Blind horse paid five dollars for an old blind horse. He sat down and I couldn't get across. Stay with me till morning. Stay all night, don't go home. Stay all night, don't go home. Stay all night, don't go home. Stay with me till morning. Squirm couldn't get him in, kicked and squirm couldn't get him in. Give you five dollars for to take him back again. Stay with me till morning. We're going to do one more tune, and uh, thank you so much for coming out, and we just had a blast playing for you on this third night of our world tour. Boy, are our arms tired. No, I hate that joke. And we, we, we just want to thank everyone. We want to thank Joe again on the sound. Thank you, Joe, so much. Beautiful sound in here. Yeah. Joe, and also, also Joel, who met us, uh, we came in. Um, Reese and Carolyn, who run the house, manage the house, made, made sure we had you know, that our cars didn't get towed away and that we knew where to go. And uh, I want to send a big special thanks to, to Sarah Craig and all the yeah. work that she does. Thank you, Sarah. All I can say is, nice place you got here. Yeah. Keep coming, keep coming. This music exists because you keep coming and we need a place to go, so. <laughs>
Thanks a whole lot, Gil. Thank you for coming. Thank you to Cafe Lena. something slow now. <laughs> Come on, Sylvia, where's your spirit of adventure? <laughs> Thanks so much, folks. We've really just had a tremendous blast playing for you folks. And that will be over by the merch table just to say hello and goodbye. And um, if I had one tune to play on a desert island with this guy for the rest of eternity, it would be this next one. Uh, if you know a tune called Salt Creek in the Bluegrass Repertoire, the Bill Monroe recorded with Bill Keith, another one of my heroes. Both of those were my heroes. Um, it was written off this next tune, evolved out of this next tune, which figures, figures largely in the old time repertoire. It's called Salt River.
Thanks again, folks. Thanks. Have a great night. Drive safe. Safe on.